rooms like this are now the front line of a new war. A war against cybercriminals bent on taking our money. In December 2021, 13.7 million Sing dollars was stolen from more than 700 OCBC bank customers. It was one of the biggest banking-related scams to hit this tiny, wired nation. In this episode of Talking Point, I'm going to find out how banking-related scams have evolved and what it takes to beat the scammers. The impact of the OCBC case sent the entire banking industry into high alert. Today, I'm at one of Singapore's largest banks, DBS. When the OCBC case broke, how did your team react? Everybody was on high alert. Our immediate efforts were focused on ensuring that our current system remained uh, robust and resilient in the face of the attacks. During this period of time, we also took the opportunity to uh, revisit some of our current processes. Right? For example, mm -hmm. we dialed up on our customer communication uh, and education. We back-tested our systems and surveillance rules to ensure that they continue to remain robust. How many suspicious activities does the DBS anti-scam team identify daily? There will be days where the teams are inundated with alerts telling them that there's possible uh, scams going on, attacks going on. It's a challenge to try to stay ahead or outsmart the fraudsters, right? There are also limits to surveillance. For example, some types of scams where customers themselves authorise the transactions to the scammers uh, would be hard for us to put any form of defence against them. Phishing scams in particular are more dangerous because they mimic the organisations and thereby was able to trick customers into giving away their credentials more easily. In a phishing attack, the target is contacted by email, telephone or text message by someone posing as a legitimate institution. The victim is then lured into providing sensitive data such as banking, credit card details, and passwords. With the victim's sensitive information, attackers can now access their account. In 2019, there were only 80 reported cases of banking-related phishing scams in Singapore. But that number has surged to more than 2,000 over the course of the pandemic. That's what's worrying Ki Ri Siong. He's been doubling down on efforts to raise awareness on such phishing scams ever since the OCBC case hit. He set up a test for me. Hi, Ri Siong. Hi, Shada. We have a bunch of SMSs, sponsored ads and emails. And your job would be to identify which you think are fake. OK, let's go. This first one here says, Dear customer, your debit and credit card temporarily has been suspended because you didn't update it yet. That's bad English right there. Such an odd number. Okay, I think this one is definitely fake. Yes, you're right. It is a fake. Uh, the features that you pointed out are the ones to look out for. The number, if it looks suspicious to you, always verify. One easy way is to look at the back of your ATM card. The bank's contact details will be there. The other thing that's troubling about this SMS is it's got very urgent language. Something that they tell you you must attend to straight away. And that's a typical message that scammers try to use to make you act without thinking. The last sign to look out for is where it came from. It says it's from SMS alert. So if it's coming from your bank, it more likely is going to come from the name of the bank. Let's go on to the next one. Usually DBS, when it's on Instagram, has a verification tick mm. that's blue. And this doesn't have that. So it's fake, I think. Yeah, very good. So here's the DBS login page interface and it looks very similar to the one I use, actually. It's hard to say, but um, I would say it's real. I'm afraid I have to say that it's... Uh, it's fake? It's fake. It's actually not the real DBS website address and that's what gives it away as a fake. The last test... Oh, it has a DBS uh, verification tick right away. So I would say that's quite real and quite safe. 
Yes, you're right. <laughs> so, very well done. I think one important thing to realize is that actually the scam messages can come in all forms. So, really keep your eyes open and take a pause when somebody asks you to do something out of the blue. Phishing scams aren't always easy to spot. This 41-year-old, who wants to be known only as Nadia, randomly received this SMS one day. It was an offer of a commemorative dollar note. All she needed to do was click a link. This happened barely two months before the OCBC scam fiasco. Hi, please come in. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. No problem. How similar is your story to the OCBC victims? The medium of clicking a link on an SMS was the same as the, as the OCBC. I clicked the link. Once you clicked on the link, it took you to the login page. And I logged into DBS because it looked legitimately like DBS online banking application. And when I did that, the messages started appearing. I sat there watching it happen in succession without me doing anything else except logging in. I absolutely knew that it was a scam when the third SMS it says, I have created a new user. I panicked, I screamed, and it was like, oh my God, what just happened? What Nadia failed to note was that the SMS with the clickable link was sent to her from a mysterious sender ID, Notice. Not DBS Bank, as it normally would be. Subsequent SMSs were genuine notifications from DBS, alerting her of ongoing activities on her bank account. Did you authenticate using the digital token or the one-time password SMS? I received the one-time password, but I never even keyed in the one-time password. It literally just comes through as somebody else is doing it for you. Right. And somebody's added a new user and somebody's transferred the money more than your account limit. That's or, scary. Yes. And then boom, it says a successful fast funds transfer of... That's a lot of money. $26,000. $26, yes. Has there been any resolution to your case? The police report. I've traced it all the way to the fact that all of the money has now left Singapore. So it's very hard to retrieve it back by any means. Well, you work in the tech industry, so you must be familiar with identifying scam emails and SMSs. Mm. So why do you think you still fell for this? The way it was written, you could not tell that this was a scam. It was actually very authentic, that you would receive it from a bank. If someone like me, you know, uh, who understands tech, can actually be a victim of this, I can only imagine for people who are less literate on technology, it's something that's actually really scary because of how sophisticated the scams have become through a simple medium like SMS. Since the OCBC scam fiasco, banks can no longer send clickable links to customers via SMS. And all major retail banks must now register their sender IDs. If a scammer tries to spoof these registered sender IDs, SMS service providers and telcos will block the messages. The question then is, can we tell the registered sender IDs from the non-registered ones? I'm about to discover just how easy it is to spoof a bank SMS. I have just received an SMS with the sender ID Urgent Bank and it stated that I made fund transfers of $2,500. I've been learning how to spot signs of banking-related scam attempts and this definitely looks like one of those. Justin Lam is what you would call a white hat, a term given to hackers who expose scammers. You received the SMS that was supposedly from a bank. So you were the one who sent me the SMS? Let me show you how it's done. Okay. We need to understand um, how the SMS protocol works. The businesses will make use of a third-party service called the SMS aggregator. So businesses to the third-party aggregators, and from there, they will forward the messages onto the telco. 
and then that's how the telco gets sent to the various um, consumers and recipients. Through that third-party aggregator, businesses would usually choose a sender ID that is related to their brand name. If it's a bank, it would be DBS, Standard Chartered, whatever the bank name is. That's where the scammers are able to come in and manipulate this process. This is a platform of one of the SMS aggregators. As you can see, that this is a very simple web interface, mm -hmm. uh, just a website. I will be able to actually set my sender ID that I want to send with. Yep, I got the message. I received it under bank. But scammers can still send sender IDs that look like official bank IDs. For example, SC Urgent or OCBC Urgent. These IDs which are not registered, right? Yeah, that's right. I could get very confused and misled by these SMSs. There's really no real way to identify which is real and which is not. Shouldn't SMS aggregators take more responsibility when it comes to protecting customers? I definitely agree with that. They don't perform a check for the physical identity uh, of their users. All right. I was able to sign up for an account with an SMS aggregator within minutes. All I needed was an email address and a phone number. And sending a spoof SMS to Justin was really straightforward. So would you say it's untraceable when scammers use these SMS aggregators? Pretty much. Especially when they make use of uh, virtual phone numbers to sign up uh, with the third-party SMS aggregators. The virtual phone number is actually uh, something that you can purchase online uh, without real verification of your actual physical identity. With phishing links being banned and an SMS registry being set up for banks, we are one step closer to beating the scammers. Or so we think. What if I told you scammers can now get to your bank account without your username and password? I've been using my mobile phone's facial recognition function to do most of my online banking transactions. On the OCBC app, for example, once I've logged in, I can transfer money out without needing any password or PIN. It's the same for pay now transfers, even up to 10,000 Sing dollars. I've always thought it to be more secure. After all, scammers can get hold of my sensitive information, but they can't get hold of my face. Or can they? Apparently, photos such as the ones obtained from social media and CCTV footage could fool the system. I am spooked, considering that photos are much easier to get than usernames and passwords. But Frederick Ho thinks his company has come up with a much more superior technology that cannot be fooled. How is Jumio's identity verification technology better than what I have on my phone? Banks should realise that facial recognition technologies on the mobile device is purely for consumers to unlock the phone. The core intention is to make it easy for their users to access the device. Most phone manufacturers do not send their technologies for uh, independent lab testing to be safe enough to be used by banking applications, uh, financial applications. It's really important where the technology uh, that a bank deploys is actually controlled by the bank. In Jumio's case, we provide our technologies to uh, international lab to be certified for liveness detection and for spoof testing. So the distinct difference between Jumio's technologies and what I have already on my phone is actually the certified testing. Yes, yeah, certified testing is definitely an important element so that consumers feel that it's safe. The certification process includes testing if scammers can spoof other people's faces using 2D photographs, video playbacks, or even hyper-realistic 3D face masks to fool the technology. Frederick had prepared a mock-up banking app to let me experience the authentication process when opening a new bank account using Jumio's identity verification technology. The process started with me providing my personal data. Next, I had to verify my identity using a government-issued identity card. Then, my selfie was captured. Jumio Certified Liveness Detection analysed my biometric template to prove that I'm a live person. 
Once my selfie has been accepted, it was compared against my identity card to establish and confirm my digital identity as a new user. How foolproof is Jumio's technology against bank scams? We should be able to filter out the attempts of uh, spoofing the uh, biometrics system itself. The face profile provides the most amount of data that a sensor could pick up. We are able to detect the human traits, light reflections on the human skin, uh, 3D depth of the human face. And these are used to determine if indeed there was a person in front of the camera and that it wasn't a photograph of uh, Shada that I downloaded from the internet and tries to access your bank account now. A number of banks in Asia Pacific, including Singapore, are already testing out Jumio's identity verification technology. That's good news, but I'm about to find out it's not just our bank accounts at stake. Well, do me a favour and smile at this camera. Well, that's us right there. The hacker has full access to our camera Gaurav Kirthi and his team fortify cybersecurity across Singapore's government agencies. He's going to show me something even more frightening than bank phishing scams. Sometimes you like to watch TV shows that are difficult to obtain in Singapore. There's a variety of ways that people bypass this. Some of them download apps and getting the malware into your phone. What they don't know is that behind the scenes, this app was created by cyber criminals and just illustratively pretend that my colleague here is one of the cyber criminals, he's actually already initiated a connection to this phone. He's fetching all of the SMS out of the phone, and what you'll see now is every single SMS that has been sent through this phone. Some types of malware allow the attacker to get even your keyboard information. So every single keystroke that you type, they're watching it. So if you're typing in your username, your passwords, your bank account details, your one-time PIN, your credit card numbers, all of that goes directly to the hacker. Oh my goodness. Well, what about the cameras on my phone? Would they have access to that as well? Well, do me a favor and smile at this camera. Well, that's us right there. The hacker has full access to our camera and the microphone. Someone can watch me through an app? Unfortunately so, and we see this quite often. So my details could be floating out there on the internet and scammers could easily exploit them. It is entirely possible. So the scammers that get direct access to your bank account, well, they'll just take money from your bank. But sometimes they can't, and so they repackage that information and sell it on the dark web to other criminals. So how much personal data is out there for grabs? I did some further digging and discovered an emerging trade online of influencers selling what's known as fools. Fools is a term used by hackers to describe the full details of potential victims. These typically include an individual's name, phone number, address and bank details. I reached out to a few sellers pretending to be an interested buyer. Two sellers responded. One of them was selling fools for as low as two pounds, which is just under four sing dollars. And I could simply pay via PayPal. I can't believe our personal details are being sold on social media at such a cheap price. We don't even have to go into the dark web. It's no wonder scammers are getting the best of us. Within weeks after the OCBC scam, the bank agreed to do a payout to victims, although the Monetary Authority of Singapore has cautioned that this is one-off. So what will it take for me to get my money back? I'm going to find out from Brian Tan. He specialises in financial technology law. This way, please. In 2020, the police investigated about $160 million worth of scams and they only recovered $57 million, a 35% recovery rate. And that's for scams in general. For banking scams, the recovery rate is actually much lower. In fact, for bank phishing scams, in 2017, uh, it was practically unheard of. So if you take out the OCBC cases out of the equation, 
based on the other remaining cases, um, we have never heard of compensation being offered by the banks. The chances of victims obtaining compensation for the losses arising out of such cases are practically zero. But there is this tiny remote chance that I could potentially get my money back. So, in which instances are these? Uh, it depends on whether uh, the bank fell short of responsibilities that it owed to the customer. Maybe it was um, tardy in its responses, or uh, there was a lapse in its security that enabled this scam transaction to take place. Uh, then the customer may have a claim against the bank. But if customers have exposed their passwords, given it to somebody else, uh, then they will have to bear uh, most, if not all, of the liability arising from that. So this is the case even if customers were tricked into giving scammers access to their bank account? Yes, from the bank's point of view, it's still the customers accessing the bank account. If the banks are able to recover some of the funds by maybe freezing accounts or reversing transactions, uh, then uh, those monies recovered can be uh, provided to the victims. Some countries, I think European countries, they have implemented insurance policy against uh, losses arising out of scams uh, by taxing electronic payments. We don't have this scheme in place. Since compensation by banks is not a given, I need to take steps to protect myself. I have to be vigilant when downloading apps so that I'm not potentially giving hackers access to my device. I shouldn't trust emails or messages with urgently worded instructions. And I'll only log into my bank account via the banking app or website.